Welcome to our webinar today. I'm very pleased to introduce Father Sean McDonough, who's joining us from Ireland. He is one of the leading Catholic eco-theologians, and he's been teaching about uh, Catholic teachings and ecological sustainability for decades. Uh, a few words of introduction. He is a, a Columban priest, originally from Ireland, and he spent many years in the Philippines. Uh, last year, he celebrated his golden jubilee as a Columban missionary priest for 40 years. And he has really been a, a unique voice within the world of Catholic ecological ethics over these decades. He, he's been speaking about Catholic ecological teachings long before anyone else was doing so. And therefore, it's important to amplify his voice and to understand his deep ecological perspectives. Uh, so through this technology of Zoom, we are pleased. I'm here in Jerusalem. I'm Rabbi Yonatan Nero. I founded and direct the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development. And we're having this conversation across the Atlantic Ocean. Jerusalem here has snow, as does Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Libya, a uh, major snowstorm just came through. And Father Sean is on the Atlantic coast of Ireland. And uh, I am pleased to uh, welcome him into this conversation. So my first question for you, Father Sean, and, and you can feel free to start your video is, I'd appreciate if you could tell us about your decade living in, and even more living in the Philippines, including in, in the jungle. And how did that experience in the jungle impact you? Uh, well, I was ordained in 1969 and I went to the Philippines. And for my first time, four, uh, three years there, I was working in lowland Christian parishes. So the first thing I did when I came to Mindanao was I spent almost a year studying the local language, which was Cebuano. Uh, so then I was able to talk to the people and also uh, in, in, engage with them. Now, the, the, the focus at that time was very much on liberation theology because the Philippines is a Catholic nation in general, it's about 70% of the people are Catholic. But a lot of people were living in, in extraordinary levels of poverty. And a lot of the land was contro were controlled by small groups of people. So very much uh, a kind of theology that came from Latin America in the 1960s began to spill over also into the Philippines. So my first engagement would be with the whole area of liberation theology. Now, not every one in the, in the Catholic Church was happy with this because very often they use some of the concepts of Karl Marx to understand the structure of society and inequity in society. And the very name of Karl Marx would uh, be would be not acceptable in in many uh, from many Catholic people and even theologians. So that was my initial experience. Uh, something very funny happened to me. My superior asked me, would I go and study canon law in Rome, do a doctorate? And I said, that's the last thing I want to do. I want nothing to do with canon law. So he said, what would you like to do? Well, I said, if I'm a missionary, then I need to understand the nature of anthropology, of how cultures operate, and the importance of a religion within the culture, both sustaining it and challenging it. So he said to me, fine. Uh, so so I, I went to the United States in Washington and I studied uh, anthropology in Catholic University and I also studied linguistics in Georgetown, which was very important to me also. So then I went back to the Philippines in 1976 and I was asked to teach in a, a university in a Muslim area. Now, the diocese of, of, of the prelature, because it wasn't a full diocese, its focus was on living with Islam, dialogue of life with Islam. 
It wasn't about converting them or being converted by them. The reality was for 400 years during the Spanish times and, and afterwards, there has been conflict between Christians and Muslims. So we felt it was our obligation to begin to understand why this had taken place and to take part in a dialogue, dialogue of life. And so I spent four years there and it was very, very important for me. I began to learn about Islam, not just theoretically about what their beliefs, but learn about the people who were Muslim. And in a sense, people who are Muslim began to learn about how Christians and how important it is that we begin to live in peace. So after that, a friend of mine asked me, would I go now and work in a tribal area with a Tivoli? These people are neither Christian or Muslim, uh, but th their lifestyle has been undermined, particularly because of the destruction of the tropical rainforest. So I said, sure, I learned anthropology, so that may be a help for me. So I headed down in 1980 to work among the Tivoli people. And that was the transforming influence on my life. Un until then, I was concerned about the human reality either uh, liberation theology or the importance of many religions uh, working together to give meaning to people in their lives. But I wasn't concerned about the wider realities of the rest of creation. And of course, one of the first things I began to realize with the destruction of the tropical rainforest, I began to read what an extraordinary destruction that was. And if I am to have any pastoral role in that place, I have to have a role about the rainforest. Now, I'm from a place called Ireland. You said we're on the, we're on the, uh, the, the Atlantic Rim. And it's, everyone would say it's a beautiful country. In terms of biodiversity, we're paupers. We're paupers. In all of Ireland, which is the size of Mindanao, there's only 26 native trees. But when I began to understand the rainforest, in a single hectare, there could be 100 to 120 or 30 uh, different species of trees. Now, of course, once you, once you remove the, the, the tropical forest, you open the, the, the soils to uh, extort like typhoons. And within a decade or within 10, 10 years or 20 years, a lot of your soils would be lost. So I began to learn all this. And to me, that was part of this new theology. And the, 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 the focus of my, Christi, uh, of my Christianity, coming from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth. And I have a role in, in understanding that. And I began to then to find out that we have, done enormously negative things towards the environment. We must educate ourselves, but much more important than education, we must develop new ways of living in a sustainable way with every species on the planet. And so I issues like the destruction of species. And there are many bio the, uh, people in biodiversity today would say, if we keep living like we are living, with 7.6 billion people, but with people in North America and Europe uh, using up three or four times more of the resources than the people I live with in Mindanao, then that is immoral. And this was the great thing that, uh, that, that the, the Archbishop or the, or the Patriarch of Constantinople in, in, in the, the extraordinary document, Laudato Si. Uh, he basically started, uh, Pope Francis quotes him immediately after he quotes Francis. He said, if you destroy the rainforest, what do you think? If you cause the destruction of species, if you cause climate change because, because of burning fossil fuel. So we say, well, what, what, what we, we, would we say about that now as Catholics? Uh, well, that's not a good idea, maybe, not a great idea. He says, these are sins. These are sins. 
Now, that's the first time that has probably ever been heard in a Catholic environment. And most people will hear that, I never knew these were sins. I may, I may, I may think of, they're not great ideas or they're not great things to be doing. But this is, so unless you begin to take all of this seriously, and then you, you had in our Catholic tradition, we had a very negative approach to the natural world. It is very difficult to read Genesis and have that, but we did. So, for example, I am the generation, I said Mass in Latin, which is our Sunday celebration, giving thanks to God for the wonder of creation and for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, you say, coming up to, to Christmas, you say we should be celebrating this extraordinary wonder. But do you know what the prayer was? Teach us, I won't, I won't burden you with the Latin. Teach us to despise the things of earth. The Latin is dispicere. You could, you could almost physically feel how awful it is and to love the things of heaven. Now, is that, is, is that consonant with, with my understanding of God's presence in our world? And in my role as a pastor, to be pastor to every reality, not just Catholics or Christians, but to but but for example, as I began to understand the rain, so I took a huge interest in deforestation in the Philippines, because there's no point in in in, in talking about these things unless you do something about it. So we began to actually reforest areas as best we could. Because it's very important to me, in the context of, of living a, a faith, that what you, what you say, you're doing something about. You're not saying one thing and doing act, actually the other. And it, it's important also that you're not believing one thing and praying almost the opposite way. Because then you're schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so that, that's, an, that's an important point you're making. Um, and um, we're seeing a little bit of glare behind you. Perhaps uh, there's a mirror. If you're able to just move to the left or right, that, that would be, that, um, okay. Uh, so I understand that Cardinal Turkson, who is the uh, prefect of the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Ecology, uh, called you in 2014 and invited you to be involved in the drafting of Laudato Si. Uh, so, so he, prior... was like, he, he, he was at that stage, he was, he was in, charge of, in, in charge of the justice and peace. What right. he wanted me to do was write something for justice and peace. And I began that in 2013. I began it with, with good friends of mine who are scientists and are theologians. So by the time of 2014, I had produced a document and I went to Rome with it. And then he told me that he had shown this to uh, Pope Francis and that they decided to have it as an encyclical rather than as, a, uh, uh, as, uh, as just a document for the justice and peace. So, so that was my involvement in, in, in Laudato Si. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. And, and so, you know, you're, you're clearly a very deep ecological thinker. How, how did you find the, the process in regards to Laudato Si, for example, in, in, there's one paragraph on population, which effectively says that human population growth has nothing to do with ecological sustainability. Can, can you explain your view on this matter and, and your role in the drafting of Laudato Si in regards specifically to the question of population and sustainability? Yeah, I, I had none. I had none. Uh, I, uh, once I began to be involved in this back in 1980, I began to take seriously some of these issues. So in one of my books, The Greening of the Church, which I, you can, I'm showing you here. Now you'll notice, is, is, is it very green? Well, actually here, here is yellow. So it, it, it's, it's not very, but actually in one of those, uh, in one of the chapters of this book, I have, will there be too many mouths to feed? So I was looking at the population of the Philippines and the population of the Tivolis. When the Spaniards left the Philippines in 1898, there were six and a half million 
Filipinos. There's now 110 million Filipinos. And I began to look at the very same reality in the context of the Tiboli people. The level of population increase every level, at every level. And would there be the resources there to, to, to ensure that these people can live in, in, in a just way and a sustainable way? So I would not accept the position of uh, on population. Uh, the, the position comes from uh, from an encyclical which was written in 1968, which people might, might still remember, was Humane Vitae, on human life, about, uh, about uh, contraception, uh, and that we couldn't in any way interfere with contraception through the use of, uh, of contraception, of con contraceptives. I don't accept that. The reality is, in, in the first world now, most people, I, I don't know of a single young Catholic who would be taking uh, Laudato Si, or sorry, taking uh, Humana Vitae as a way of living their lives. They have two or three children. They don't have 14 or 15 or 16 children. So we have an obli obligation now to take seriously. We know, for example, that at the moment, the world population is about 3.7, uh, 6.7, 7.6 billion people. Uh, 40, 50 years from now, the population of Europe will be down by one third, by one third. But the population of Africa will have grown by two billion. And does that mean that they're going to move through the destruction of Africa in the way we've done in many other continents? And is, is that true? Is that sustainable? And can that be justified by a religious reality? I do not think that the Catholic Church has put sufficient time and thought into its position on population. Now, there are, you can make a very good point that we in the Western world use 10 times more resources or 20 times more resources than the people of Lake Cebu. And in a sense, that particular paragraph from, from uh, Laudato Si refers to that. But even if it is true, uh, the reality is, ten is, is can I you have to ask is can the local world that we live in and the, the world now as a whole sustain ten billion or fifteen billion people? And we have an obligation to in, address that because almost everything we've done in the last seventy years has done enormous damage to our planet. And the, the place I point out mostly, which we don't even even think of, seventy percent of our earth is, is, is covered by oceans. And in my lifetime, I'm a World War II baby, 1944, we have done horrendous damage to the reality of our ocean. Uh, look at, again, plastic is a, is a post-World War II reality. It's almost at the North Pole and the South Pole, and it's doing enormous damage right across the, the oceans of the world. Up in the North Pacific, there's a whole area, almost twice the size of Ireland, of plastics. And think of the interaction with that of, the, of plastics with all the creatures of the sea. So we have to be very careful when we say, this, is this sustainable into the future? Because that's what I think pastoral care is. Pastoral care is, also, oh, let's eat, drink, and make merry, for tomorrow we die. No, we have a serious obligation, and not just for humans. We have a serious obligation for every creature. As I said, people in biodiversity say we are on course to wipe out one million species in the time in this century. What's that going to do to our world? Extinction is forever. So, so I would I would have a, a much more nuanced position on population than is uh, reflected. But I do know there were a lot of uh, uh, pressure in the church to have something on population in Laudato Si. I see. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, so it's been over five years since Pope Francis published Laudato Si on care for our common home. To what extent do you think it has reached parishes and priests and to, do you think 
what else needs to be done to further its really reaching Catholic communities. And you can also just move your uh, video camera a little bit higher so we can see the top of your head. Great, yeah. thank you. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is one of the great things of the Vatican II was it redefined the church. Because before that, you know, the Vatican I said the Pope was infallible, and then the next row were bishops and cardinals, and then eventually you got the ordinary faithful. The biggest breakthrough, which happened in 1963, that we said, what, what figure can we use to talk about the church? And they said the people of God. Not the hierarchy, not the popes, the people of God. So that's where it must happen. Don't forget, I'm a priest. I spent seven years studying philosophy and theology. I live in an area where uh, my seminary was in an area where oak trees, huge groves of oak trees. Now, oak supports about over 350 different species from birds to all kinds of animals and plants and insects. So if I was teaching the uh, uh, something on the church today, where would I sit myself if I was in Ireland? I'd sit myself under an oak tree. I'd say, this is what church is about, supporting other realities. And you can see it in the structure of God, of, of, of God has created. So what I would like to see, so, so in other words, I learned nothing there. And I don't know of any, very few priests learn anything about, about, about uh, ecology. So what I would love to see is in dioceses and parishes that particularly the laity, particularly people who have competences in these areas, but people are teaching biology. Teach, people are teaching chemistry, but they get together as a group to understand these issues and then to come up with policies and programs. For example, every, every single diocese in Ireland reaches the sea except one. There's not a single diocese that mentions the oceans and what we've done to them by overfishing, by plastics by increasing the acidity of the waters through climate change uh, and the destruction of coral reefs. Actually, there's not a single uh, diocese I know anywhere in the world where it has anything on the oceans. And yes, life has been there for 3.2 billion years before it was ever on land. And so we're not, so that's what I would like to see because if it's, if it's in the hands of priests who didn't learn anything about it and see it as something extraneous to our our pastors, our, our, our religious reality. Our, our creation is not extraneous. Our, our creation is central to our world and to, to, to the very first lines of scripture. God created the heavens and the earth. So like, could, could there be anything more clear? So that's the way I'd like to see it go. Now, I, I'm involved here in Ireland, and as a bishop, been, been appointed to, be, to try to bring these, uh, bring these uh, realities into the local church. Like I'd like to see every, every diocese having something on their website saying, what things should we do and not do? We have destroyed almost every single, uh, all the major fishing areas in the world in a period of 70 years. Is that what we want to do into the future? Like in, in, my, in, in, my, in, in, in your country and in my country. Like if I go out shopping this morning, as I did, almost everything I see is in single-use plastic. Uh, the, the very simple way to get rid of that is to put a tax on it. And that, that, and that like I know because when I come, came home here, I knew the minister for the environment. This is about 15 years ago. And I was trying to get hit... Uh, not to, uh, to, to, to to tax very small the, the plastic, the throwaway plastic that bag, because you could see them all over the countryside. Oh, he said, people love their plastic bag. I say, I know they love their plastic bag. So he, he, he introduced 10 cents, 10 cents only. And in, in two months, the use of single-use plastic 
bags fell by 95%. That's, that's the world we're talking about. So these are the policies that we need to see. I don't want to hear, hear lovely uh, thoughts and everybody lo loves the natural world. I want to see us doing something with plastic, which is a global issue. And, uh, and uh, so, so we, we, we have to be our prayer life, what we believe and what we do has, ha has to be working all together. Yeah. Right, I, I, I certainly agree with you about the, the importance of that. And here in Israel, the government imposed a tax on plastic at supermarkets and that also significantly reduced the amount of plastic, that, plastic bags that people bought. Uh, you know, to at the checkout stand. So just to follow up on that, you know, I, I would imagine that there's not a lot of Catholic priests or imams or rabbis or Protestant pastors uh, who speak in their homilies about plastic use and religious teachings. And there's actually a study by the Pew Center that says that, that most clergy in America, no matter the denomination or the religion, um, don't speak about climate change. Uh, although when they do speak about climate change, it actually motivates people to take action. So what do you think needs to happen? I mean, for example, I, 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 was, I, I met you first in the Vatican about five years ago at a conference. And, and when I was there, I, I had a meeting with um, someone with a, uh, an archbishop from the Congregation for the Clergy who uh, spoke about the Ratio Fundamentalis, the, uh, the document uh, that governs seminary education for Catholic seminaries. And I understand that now ecology is one of 30 topics that is part of, that is supposed to be part of seminary education. But as, as you were saying earlier, creation isn't peripheral to our existence is actually central. We live on earth <laughs> and we depend on God's creation for our existence as, as people in the United States are painfully aware of right now when there are temperatures that are well below freezing and the power goes out, um, especially in minority and poor communities. So, so what do you think in terms of Catholic seminary education needs to happen to raise the importance of ecological sustainability within it? Well, we, we need to have uh, 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 better, better texts on it. But we also, the Catholic tradition is, is problematic at the moment because, because, uh, because women have no role, basically, uh, in, in the church. I believe myself that if, if, if we had women priests and, and archbishops, uh, for example, we'd have a much better chance. And I, I, I make the point, uh, Vatican II, for example, which, which is a great, a great four years for the Catholic Church. It brought the church up to date to, from, from the, the 15th century, uh, 16th century Council of Trent. But there was nothing on, on the environment. Now, Rachel Carson has published her book uh, actually before Vatican II happened. She published it in April of, 2000, uh, of, of 1962. So I think if we had if we had uh, fifty percent of the bishops at Vatican II were women, then it probably have come up with, with much more. And that's my experience actually, working inside and outside the church. Women are much more sensitive to these areas, possibly because of the, their, their their understanding of their children and all that. So I would like to see that. Then I would like to see uh, works starting. The, the, the diocese would say we'll do something this year. For example, maybe a country like, like Ireland produces a lot of milk. Is this the best way of going forward? And let's then spend all of this year understanding about how we're producing milk, how we're using fossil fuels, how we use pesticides, insecticides, uh, and have religious realities going with it. Like to go, to go back to the patriarch of Constantinople, these are sins. They're, they're not, they're, they're, they're not something, well, we don't really care. So, I'd like to see that. Now, to be fair, at, at, the, at the central level, since that time we met in Rome, there's a lot of people working uh, uh, in, in trying to bring uh, Catholic, uh, Catholic bishops and priests more into this area. And I, I, I support them a lot. 
but I'd like to see a lot more hands-on engagement. And it won't be hands-on unless you marry theory with practice. There's no point in talking about practice if, if, you, if your theory is, 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 is not following. And then there's no point in talking about practice if your prayers, if what you're saying in your prayers is the direct opposite to what you believe now about God's creation. You said God's creation. How would you get on? How long would you get on without oxygen in the air, by the way? You'd be gone in two minutes. <laughs> you know. So when I talk about phytoplankton in the oceans, that, that actually 50, 50 or 60 percent of the oxygen of, of, for our planet is created by those. Oh, well, sure, that's a, we're, we're interested. Well, well, I am interested. <laughs> without oxygen, I would last two minutes. So it's that level of engagement that we need to celebrate and understand and, and, and develop a new humility with. One of the things about this pandemic, I think, it may be giving us a little bit of, of, of humility that with all, with all the science in the world, which is great, and I'm very pro science, uh, we're very, we can be very, very, very vulnerable, as we, as we found out during this pandemic. And, 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 we, and of course, we can also realize that we're entering the age of pandemics because of the way we're mishandling the earth, the way we're destroying tropical forests, and then you're this extraordinary global business of, of, of bushmeat. And, and that's exactly where, where uh, COVID-19 came from in, in Wuhan. That actually was when, when, when I'm a Colombian, as you said, and when we went to China in 1920, we actually went to the Diocese of Wuhan. And I actually know the wet market there because I've often brought, brought people there. Now they don't like, to, they, they always like the fish alive before they sell it to you. But you see all kinds of animals that you won't see anywhere in that wet market. And the, the, some of the assumptions is that the, the virus came through um, from a bat through pangolins and on to, in, in, into humans. Now, the pangolins themselves are, are an endangered species, but 60,000 a year are imported into China, into China for Chinese medicine. So this is the world we're living in. And you could say of, of this pandemic, it, it's, very, it, it, it's very infectious. But we've had more pandemics in the last 30 or 35 years than we have in the, in the previous 500 years before that because of what we're doing to the planet. So all of these things should motivate people, and particularly people of the religious state, to be much more respectful of the natural world and to make sure that our living on it is done in some way that is sustainable, because at the moment it's not. Okay, so th thank you for that. And um, one, of, one of the people on, on this uh, webinar uh, on commenting on Facebook uh, as we air this live is, is bringing, raising the question about, um, about indigenous peoples and um, the relationship of the Catholic Church to them. I know there was a synod uh, about a year and a half ago focused on the Amazon and indigenous peoples. Um, in, in the year 1540, Father Domingo de Santo Tomas, a Spanish Catholic priest who, who arrived in Peru, he, he saw the Potasi mine, uh, which was the largest silver mine in the world. And, and because of the hundreds of thousands of people who worked and lived there was actually one of the largest cities in the world, amazingly, in the 16th century. And, and, and this uh, Spanish Catholic priest described it, quote, that he described the mine as, quote, a mouth of hell into which a great mass of people enter every year and are sacrificed by the greed of the Spaniards to their God. Uh, and so here he provided an early Catholic critique of extractive capitalism. It's, it's been almost 500 years since he wrote that, but mining in Peru and many other countries still takes a significant pull, toll on people and other living beings. And, and actually with the, this push toward uh, electric cars, the mining of lithium and cobalt will likely increase. Um, and jewelry given in marriage is one key source of metal demands 
what do you say to people getting married today in terms of, of if they're wanting to buy a gold or a silver or platinum ring? How, how do Catholic teachings relate to mining and the extraction of, of precious metals, which are no longer infinite on this planet? And never well, were. Well, as I said, you are an atheist. First of all, we have to educate ourselves. So if you're running a program for for uh, couples who are going to get married, that would be one of the areas that you, you would take up. In, in, my, in my recent book, uh, Robots, Ethics, and the Future of Jobs, I have a, a long presentation on, on that, on the electric cars, and particularly where the mining is, ha is taking place in, in Zai, in the Central African Republic. So, so these are issues that should underpin our, our response as Catholics or any Christian or any 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 Jews or Muslims, and that's the kind of thing that's necessary. Understand and uh, make it. so. I, I think if you explain that to people that, that the, uh, the the their their gold ring is this this is this is what's costing the earth and people today. It's a disaster for them. Now, do you want? Your love, which you're talking about symbolizing in your marriage, to be represented, to be represented by gold or silver, and I'm sure most of the people we, we we would not, and 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 I'm sure you could get in many other ways to have to have them express their love in a way that will sustain the, the earth rather than destroy it. And it has taken us a long time. I mean, it's the Spanish, the Spanish uh, conquistadors. Were pretty awful, but so I, I I'm Irish and I recognize our neighbor did much much the same here from the 12th century onwards. So that's that's what happens with with, with colonialism. <clears throat> and again, we must make sure that we critique that, and we critique any religion that denies something. There, like for me, uh, climate change is one of the most important moral issues of our time. The science of it is unbelievably clear at this moment. We know about the levels of carbon dioxide we have put into the atmosphere in the last hundred years. So there's no way of denying that. And yet you have many Christians in the United States, the former president of the United States, uh, rubbishing the fact that climate change is taking place. Now, to me, that's an appalling way to live today. And uh, when I think that Part of the, uh, almost half the Catholics in the United States voted for him, mainly because he said he was pro-life. But I, I'd like to ask migrants how how, how much pro-life he thinks that they were for him, you know. Uh, and so, like, we need we, we need to what we believe and what we do and what we pray needs to be working together. And uh, I think uh, so. I, I I would hope that we would we would. Um, help to change people as we go through like like I, I, I wouldn't know anyone, young couple I know here who would want uh, a gold ring if they thought that this this is where it comes from. And, 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 and the pain for the earth and for people in producing this. Does this do you want this? I would say absolutely no. Okay. Thank thank you for that helpful insight. Um, I want to mention a question which is coming in from Los Angeles, uh, from the Pasadena area, um, from the uh, someone with whom I work, um, and it relates to a, a movement that, that she perceives as happening within the Catholic Church of moving toward traditionalism, uh, the quote, saving of souls, and seeing respect for life just as abortion issues and, and essentially not seeing uh, ecological sustainability and, and, and caring for our common home as a life issue, that, that life is considered um, really focused on, on you know, abortion and, and, and opposing contraception, whereas a, a more holistic view understands that, well, we need to think about what will happen to that child when it's born and, you know, the children that are freezing today because they don't have power from an Arctic storm 
that is that is made worse by climate change and the destabilization of the jet stream from the Arctic. Um, so, so essentially, you know, I, I know you've spoken in the past about about certain Catholic traditionalists focusing on culture wars, but it, that seems to be as strong today, perhaps as as in some other times. Um, how, how what can we do to elevate? The, the issues that you're bringing up within parishes and within seminary education? It's a very simple thing called data. You know, I talk about climate change because it's real, it's real. And it's, it, it'll, be, it'll be very real for these people and their, and their great grandchildren 80 years from now. I've been writing on, on climate change since 1980, and I've seen the extraordinary damage already done. Are they aware of, for example, the acidification of the ocean and that life began here? So I have, have very little time for, for that, but I, I try to present and I have to be very clear about Laud Laudato Si. One of the lovely things about Laudato Si, it was the first time ever of a, a religion that we have over a billion people where actually the Pope used science to actually talk about what's happening to the oceans, what's happening to water, what's happening to biodiversity, what's happening in climate change. And you cannot deny these unless you want to de de deny everything around you. And that, this is what the cultural wars do. So you find the situation that where, where you have uh, bishops who are much more critical of Joe Biden because in, in a democracy, he, hasn't, uh, he, he, he accepts that some people would wish to have abortion. Now, I have said exactly one sentence there but I'll say no more because I'm a man and I know situation, most people have to, who, who make these decisions are women. And I don't often know the context in which they have to make these decisions. But I would have a lot more time for him who's talking about addressing climate change, uh, working back on biodiversity, you know, and creating a, a society uh, where all of us can, can work together and not against each other. And one of the most awful I think legacies of the last president is people are fighting each other. And is that, is that actually what religious people want to be doing? And so I feel uh, I, I, I'd be much closer to, uh, to the presidency of, of Joe Biden. Now, the interesting thing is this is a war in the United States. Almost every country in Europe has at some level introduced uh, uh, termination of pregnancies and abortion. But you, you, don't, you, you don't find the same level of religious destruction or religious presentations here. People are not saying, uh, the, the bishops here are not saying to our the prime minister that he can't go to, to Holy Communion at Mass. So it's very much uh, a reality of the United States. And uh, the, you ask me how to deal with it. The only way to deal with it is by by facts, by data, and that's what science does. And it's not I think or maybe and I wonder. No, no. <laughs> Tell me, we've increased, we've doubled the amount of of, of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in the last two, uh, 150 years, and, and you and you actually you can measure that. So it's, it's not a question of what, what you like or you know or you don't like. It's measurable. So. Okay, well, thank you for that response. Um, there's also some questions that are coming in in terms of about living a simple lifestyle or a, or a sober lifestyle. The, the thrust of consumer society today and, and the, it is promising people a, a large house, a nice car, uh, you know, the newest smartphone, uh, airplane travel, eating a lot of meat and dairy and eggs. And, and as you know, that, that lifestyle for 8 billion people or 11 billion people, which is what we're moving to by the end of this century, is, is, is something that, that, that God's planet was not geared for, uh, amazingly enough. Um, that, and, and the earth systems are hemorrhaging already under the current strain of, of 8 billion people. Um, how do you, what, what do you say in terms of simple living and, and sober living uh, from a religious perspective, I think it's absolutely essential. It's absolutely, again, that's essential because we say that the, the religious living has to be out of the reality in which we find ourselves today. 
as you very rightly put it, particularly in the Western world, we have, we have uh, forms of living at the moment which are way beyond what's sustainable in our planet. And I believe, for example, we in Ireland should be asking ourselves, yes, about the use of meat. Yeah, <laughs> maybe not. Like, I, I lived in the Philippines for 25 years. We had meat, but it was just part of maybe one meal a day. Whereas here in our, and we, we're, we're uh, saying to people, we can grow uh, cows, you know, for almost many, many parts of the world. But I don't think we should be doing that. Actually, we should be more focusing particularly on grains and on vegetables, because these are the foods that would be, and that again is looking at each of these issues from the perspective of, of, of the science and then marrying them to my, to my tradition. It is central to anyone who is a Jew or Muslim or a Christian to live a simple life. And certainly, if you look at the example of Jesus in the, in the Gospels, he did exactly that. And it was not an easy option for him because, uh, because life was, was much more difficult at the times. And uh, I mean, the, the, the prayer I always say in, 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 in the prayer that he gave us, the, the Our Father, he said, we, we say in English, forgive us our trespasses. That's nonsense, the first order, is forgive us our debts. Because so many people were in debt because of the Romans, because, because of the tax, of, because of the possibility of losing their land. So he was totally aware of living in, in a way that is not destructive. But we have to bring that teaching into the 21st century and make sense of it here. Okay, great. So, so another question that's coming in, there's really a very lively chat happening uh, both in Zoom and on Facebook with yeah. uh, dozens of people participating. In term, there, as you're aware, the, the UN goal has is seeking to protect 30% of nature by 2030 to protect biodiversity and the climate, mm -hmm. uh, including the oceans. Mm -hmm. What is happening in the Catholic community to try to promote this goal? Very little, unfortunately, no. Uh, now, at, at the central level, there's quite a bit, and I'm part of that. We have web webinars every, uh, every month. But as, as I said, every diocese in Ireland and in the, in the United States, is, reaches the ocean, should be talking about it, protecting the ocean. But talking about it in terms, again, of data and of science. Don't ask me about it. But if we, if every single fishing area in the world has been overfished, if we if we're destroying the oceans through acidification of the water, then these are very serious issues and will have awful impact on those who come after us, not just humans, but other species who come, come after us. So, again, in many ways, our, our religious attitude is going to be determined by the science that we know to be real about these issues. And how do we live in a sustainable way, as you say, if we have by the end of the, the 21st century, 11 billion people on the planet, how can the, the planet sustain that? And the, these are issues for all of us. And uh, certainly issues for Jews, Muslims and Christians, the people of the Abrahamic faiths. Uh, that, that, that we take seriously, that God, this is God's world, and we have an extraordinary ob obligation here to live up to our role as understanding it and not destroying it. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I want to go back for a minute to the question in, with Indigenous people, and you mentioned that in the Philippines, there was a lot of deforestation that was taking place. Uh, it w was that by the tribe that you were living with, or was who? Why was that deforestation occurring? By the company. Basically, deforestation started in the Philippines in a big way. It happened between the two world wars, but basically, it took off in the nineteen um, in the nineteen fifties. And you see, in many areas in Mindanao, uh, a lot of my colleagues who went there earlier would you know would be fairly uh, that. The, the, the working for these companies, they paid very well, quite well, not very well. So people were happy enough and you were working in a parish, you were trying to build a school, you were trying to get some money uh, to do all that, to pay your teachers and all that. So there were, maybe it's not too bad about what's happening to the forest. Of course, the, the reality is when so much of, like, I think there's probably less than 10% of the, of the 
Philippine forests, the five different uh, Filipino forests uh, left. And that's just a disaster. That's, that isn't just bad news. But most of it was done by initially uh, American companies, uh, then uh, the Japanese moved in, uh, Koreans moved in, and, and Filipinos moved in. So that's, that's what I took, took my stance against. And it was very difficult. And two of my colleagues actually were murdered. Uh, a priest were murdered because of positions they took on, 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 uh, on, on present, uh, pre preventing deforestation. And you see, the problem with deforestation is it's, got, it's gone, it's gone forever. As I said, a dipterica forest could have 100 different species, which is, for someone like from Ireland, there's only 26 different species of trees for the whole country. Uh, I'm amazed by that. But is that part of, of, of my, my, my religious understanding? That should be part of it. This is an extraordinarily beautiful place. And to destroy it like that irreversibly is horrendous. And a horrendous insult to our God. I see. And what, I, I was often involved in those discussions. When I was in the lowlands, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe uh, these companies weren't great, or maybe once I got to Lake Sibu and I opened my eyes and saw what was happening. <laughs> Again, data. I, I just said, "This is this is terrible," and this has no place into the future. If we want to say we want, because the, the real issue of the Philippines is, uh, will, will they be able to, to feed our people? Don't forget now, with most of the forest gone, when you have, when you have um, typhoons there, you will hear for, on, on the news, you will hear, oh, uh, only, only 50 people died in the storm. That's great. Like, unfortunately, in 2015, five, five, over 5,000 5, people died. But you won't hear how many tons of topsoil was taken off the land in that storm. And how many was taken in the next storm. And there's, there's at least 13, 13 typhoons each year gets into the Philippines. So how long will it be before the wonderful topsoil that was there is all washed away? And do we have any responsibility for that? Or we say, well, we didn't know what was happening. Or, well, no, we have serious obligations for that. And the people who live there in the next 20 or 30 years will, will, will not be very happy with the way we've left it. Okay, thank you for that. So I wanna just ask you one last question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Catholic Church uh, held a synod of bishops focused on the Amazon and indigenous people. And, and since you lived for many years among indigenous people in the Philippines, you have been a particular appreciation for their wisdom. And uh, the, the Brazilian Academy of Sciences just, uh, accepted a new member, the first indigenous um, uh, person, I believe, on, on, on the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. How, how is the Catholic Church elevating the wisdom of indigenous Catholics in order to help us to chart a sustainable course forward? Uh, well, in the areas I work in the, in the, in the Philippines, East Diocese would have a person who will was uh, kind of co coordinating these areas. And certainly in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of effort to learn from how indigenous people are operating in the areas where, where they are operating and to sustain that. But in, in, in many ways, uh, we would need, have needed a lot more of that. One of the issues, for example, that came up at the Synod of Bishops is uh, in the Amazon was how would we, like if we're going to, we say we're, we're, we're Catholic Christians and people worship each, each Sunday morning, but you, all, you have only one priest that come, up, can come around maybe once or twice a year. Why can't we have local people who will, who will be celebrators of the Eucharist each, uh, each Sunday in their local and that they're integrated into their local community and into, their, into the churches and such? And then I want to see that these aspects of their culture are incorporated into the church. So they're not the same as the diocese of, of Los Angeles. The diocese in, in the Amazon should be totally different. 
because the people there are totally different. And that was one of the things I pushed a lot in the context of when I was working among the Timoli, that we need very different structures here because Timoli is operated the way that Cebuano is not operated. And why should we be pushing them along the way that's fast, part Western and part lowland, lowland Filipino culture? Because they have felt oppressed by these, by the way, for the last 400 years. And so we have to be very sensitive. So there's no point in saying, oh, we are very, we're very, we, 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 we love uh, tribal peoples, we do everything we can to, to, to uh, unless you're, in, 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 you're bringing their culture into your understanding of faith and the way, and the, way the church is organized, well, that's not true. They're nice ideas, but they're not real. Okay, well, I want to thank you for this very interesting and um, enlightening conversation about uh, Catholic social teaching and Catholic environmental ethics and, and your role as, as a leader in that over the past several decades. I also just want to mention in closing that um, I published a book recently, Eco Bible and Ecological Commentary on Genesis and Exodus. I'm looking for we... that. I, I'm looking for that. I saw that and I'm looking for it. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we, we sent copies to the Catholic leadership in the United States, as well as uh, the Anglican leadership in England and, and a few hundred other clergy uh, and, and religious figures. So um, if that, I'll, that, ask that were, I'll ask you for a copy. Yes, I, 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 I'll, I'll get you a copy. And uh, we're, we're trying to, as you said, to bridge theology and practice. So it both it's an ecological interpretation of the Hebrew Bible, together with looking at practical actions that we can take that flow from that. So um, I really want to thank you. Uh, congratulations, for the, for congratulations. I really think that's very important, that our, that our basic documents have this, uh, th this openness now to this understanding of, of the earth, that we're part of it all. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Father Sean McDonough, for, for a wonderful conversation. And thank you everyone for joining us. And hopefully you'll be able to take this forward in uh, both uh, theology and prayer and in practice. Have a great day.